Uh, Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, and keep your Bibles open this morning. We're going to be going back to the text again and again. And we're going to be looking this morning at verses 13 through 16 as we consider a kingdom for children, as you see our children going up to Children's Church uh, this morning, as we consider a, a kingdom for children. One of my favorite authors uh, is C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis has a children's series. Are they really a children's series? It's the Chronicles of Narnia, and the first book in the Chronicles of Narnia is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And the book opens with four children who are sent out to the countryside because there is war. And there are air raids that are bombing the city. So they're sent to stay with this old professor in a very large house. This large house has many rooms. And so one day, these four children begin playing hide-and-seek. And Lucy, the youngest, finds this wardrobe. And she thinks, oh, this is the perfect place to hide. And so she opens the doors to the wardrobe, and she's going to hide at the back of the wardrobe. And she walks into the wardrobe past these fur coats, and she keeps walking. And she walks further, and she thinks, wow, this must be an enormous wardrobe. And all of a sudden, under her feet, she hears crunching. And then she notices that it's very, very cold. And she realizes that she's walking on snow. And she's been whisked away into another world, another kingdom, another realm. Right? And this is how the adventures of Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy begin in Narnia with Aslan. And I think it's the way many of our best stories begin Right, Once upon a time, and all of a sudden you're whisked away into a foreign land, a different kingdom. And have you ever noticed that it seems to be children who are drawn into that other world, into that other kingdom? Well, here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. The kingdom of God is a place for children. The kingdom of God is a place for children. And we're going to look at our text under three headings this morning. In verse 13, we're going to look at bringing children. Bringing children. And then in verses 14 and 16, we're going to think about belonging children or children who belong. And then in verse 15, we're going to look at becoming children. So bringing children, belonging children, and becoming children. Look with me at Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. So far, God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, may he write its eternal truth upon all of our hearts. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come this morning gathered as your people around your word, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel, through the work of your Holy Spirit, and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. So first of all, becoming, excuse me, first of all, bringing children, bringing children. Look look at verse 13 here. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. Now, this rebuke of the disciples culturally makes a whole lot of sense. You see, children were at the bottom of the barrel in society. They were on the lowest rung of the status ladder. They had no status. They had no value. Children were worthless in these times. And especially when you considered the high mortality rates, there was some question as to whether children would live to the age of maturity. And as a result, 
important people didn't associate with children. The first musical I ever saw live in the theater, I was probably nine years old, was Annie. And in Annie, there were two central characters. Of course, Annie, this spunky, red-headed orphan who had a hard knock life but was convinced that the sun will come out tomorrow. And opposite her is Daddy Warbucks. Now, of course, in the 2014 remake of the movie, that character is Will Stax and is played by Jamie Foxx. But both Will Stax and Daddy Warbucks were important people. Daddy Warbucks was a millionaire. Will Stax became a billionaire. I think that was just inflation. Um, but they're, they're both very important people. They're high-powered businessmen. They've got meeting after meeting. And so as a result, the tension in the movie is that Daddy Warbucks or Will Stax doesn't have any time for children. He doesn't associate with children because important people don't associate with children, right? And that was certainly true in Jesus' time. Important people didn't associate with children. Certainly rabbis, somebody as important as a rabbi, didn't associate with children. And doesn't that still maybe happen today? Right? Children tend to get marginalized as insignificant and unimportant. So culturally, this rebuke of the disciples makes sense. But contextually, it makes no sense at all. This should stop you. I mean, if you've been reading through Mark, this should stop you in your tracks. Why? Well, if you go back to Mark chapter 9, the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest. And Jesus sits the 12 disciples down and says, hmm, you're not quite getting here. If anyone should be first, he must be last and servant of all. And then maybe you can picture the disciples kind of puzzling, questioning, what does he mean? Jesus is thinking, you're not quite getting it. And so he takes a child and he puts the child in the midst of them. And he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. You see, God's kingdom, Jesus is saying, is about the least of these. It's about the least of these. In the Old Testament, God was a God of whom Nicholas Wolterstorff calls the quartet of the vulnerable. He's a God who identifies with the widow and the fatherless and the sojourner and the foreigner. And Jesus, in his day, cares about the marginalized, the insignificant, and the unimportant. He cares about those who are out, those who have no status, those who have no place in society. Those who are out have a special place in God's kingdom. You see, it's an upside-down kingdom. But now, just 26 verses later, in Mark chapter 10, the disciples completely miss it. Not only do they not receive the children, they take it a step further. They rebuke those who are bringing the children. You see, they've completely forgotten that Jesus' kingdom is a place for children. But I want to stop for a moment and consider the people who are bringing the children, probably the parents. We know very little about them. All we have is the universal generic they, verse 13. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But I would argue that that simple action of bringing their children to Jesus speaks volumes. It says so much about them. These people want their children to be associated with Jesus, to be connected to Jesus, to be touched by Jesus. These parents want Jesus' blessing for their children. And I want to stop right there because I think that begs the question, what do we want for our children? Where are we bringing our children you see, we're all bringing our children to something for blessing. We're all looking to some kingdom, some dream, some hope, and saying, if my child can have that blessing, then they'll flourish, then they'll be okay, then they'll thrive. Where are we bringing our children? Maybe you're putting your hope in the kingdom 
of school, right? If we can just get schooling right, then they'll be okay. It's, maybe it's homeschooling or public schooling or Christian schooling or private schooling, but if we can just get that okay, then they'll thrive. Or maybe you're bringing them to the kingdom of manners. If we can just get them to say, yes, sir, or no, ma'am. If they can just show respect for their elders, then they'll flourish. Or maybe we're bringing them to the kingdom of sports. We're bringing them to this baseball camp and that traveling team and this soccer league and those special les lessons. Or maybe we're bringing them to the kingdom of extracurriculars, this speech and debate tournament, that club, this play, that instrument. And we're bringing our children here and we're bringing our children there and we're searching for blessing. But sometimes I fear that we're more like the disciples than the parents in this text. We're bringing our children here, and we're bringing our children there, and sometimes we forget to bring them to Jesus. We end up barring our children from Jesus rather than bringing our children to Jesus. And they're spread so thin among so many different kingdoms that they have no anchor. They've become just like us. Now, all of these things, schooling and sports and extracurriculars, they can help your child thrive and flourish if it's done appropriately, if it's done in moderation. But we should never let these things forbid us from bringing our children to Jesus for his blessing. You see, bringing our children to Jesus should be more important than every other bringing. Are you bringing your children to Jesus uh, around the dinner table, may maybe at church or in Sunday school and discipleship relationships? We should be bringing our children to Jesus every day of our lives. It's the most important bringing we'll ever do. So bring our children, bring your children, right, to soccer. Bring your children to gymnastics, but always, always, always bring your children to Jesus because his blessing is going to be more important than any other blessing. Now, some of you are empty nesters, and this seems all very past, and some of you don't have children, and this seems all very future, but may I suggest to you this morning that wherever we are in life, we're always practicing a pattern of bringing. You're always bringing yourself, always bringing, always looking to some kingdom for blessing. Right now, you're practicing a pattern of bringing in your own life through your habits and routines and choices. Are we barring ourselves from Jesus? Or are we bringing ourselves to Jesus? Where are we looking for blessing? And by the way, parents, I would argue that we can only bring our children where we've been bringing ourselves, bringing children. But then secondly, belonging children, belonging children in verses 14 and 16. Jesus sees the disciples rebuking those who are bringing the children. And did you catch his response? Verse 14, when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. He was irate. He was outraged. And he says to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that children belong in God's kingdom. That is, it is a place for children. And this is deeply radical and completely countercultural. It turns society, everything that the disciples knew, completely on its head. One commentator explains it this way. In the Hellenistic world, children had no status. Religiously, they were non-entities, disqualified from participation. In ancient Judaism, participation in the life of the synagogue began for males at age 13, when a boy became a bar mitzvah, or a son of the commandment, and they were responsible for keeping the Torah. But the kingdom of God is different. It's a different economy. In God's economy, everyone has value because everyone 
from the youngest to the oldest is made in the image of God. Children were outsiders in the kingdom of the world. But they were insiders in the kingdom of God. You see, here, children have value. They have a place. They belong. And so we shouldn't hinder the children from coming to Jesus. This rabbi, this king, cares about the least of these. He speaks to children. And this is so shocking. It's so different than the kingdom of the world. You can understand, maybe, and give a little grace, maybe, to the disciples. And you can understand why Jesus had to repeat it again and again. Sometimes we like to condemn the disciples a little bit, don't we, in our hearts? But don't we tend to do just what the disciples have done here? Don't we tend to dismiss and marginalize people who aren't like us? We're constantly weighing and evaluating and judging and drawing lines. We're defining who's in and who's out. It's subtle. Maybe it's even subconscious. We certainly wouldn't want to admit it. But deep down, sometimes we think what? Those people are beyond Jesus' reach. And we tend to look down on people who don't look like us, don't think like us, don't love like us, don't speak like us, don't pray like us, don't vote like us, don't use technology the way we do, don't learn like us, don't react like us, don't drive like us, don't see the world like us, don't hold values like us. Right? We tend to look down on anyone who is different than us. And we tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we tend to assume the worst about others. And it's all self-righteousness. We, like the disciples, think that we're in and others are out. But in God's economy, there's a place for the least of these. There's a place for the people who aren't like us. In fact, in God's economy, it's the people who think that they're in who are out. And it's the people who know that they're out who are in. And shouldn't that change the way we see the world? In God's economy, even the least of these, even children have value. They have a place. They belong. Did you notice the difference between the parents' request and Jesus' response? Look at the parents' request in verse 13. And they were bringing the children to him that he might touch them. But Jesus goes above and beyond. Look at his response in verse 16. What does Jesus do? He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on them. You see, the parents just asked for Jesus to touch the children. But what does Jesus do? He embraces them. He picks them up. He holds them in his arms. He lays his hands on them, and he blesses them. Can you hear, can you feel the warmth, the intimacy, the care and connection? Jesus delights in the children. He embraces the children. He welcomes the children. They are recipients of the kingdom of God. They belong. But he goes one step further. It's not just that they belong. They actually receive Jesus' blessing. They actually receive Jesus' blessing. Belonging children. And then thirdly, becoming children. Becoming children. Verse 15. Jesus has been saying that children belong to the kingdom of God. But he's actually saying more than that. He's saying something even more radical. He says that the kingdom of God belongs to children. There at the end of verse 14, to such belongs the kingdom of God. You see, it's one thing to say that children belong to the kingdom of God, but it's a very different thing to say that the kingdom of God belongs to children. What does Jesus mean by that? Well, he goes on to explain it in his next, in the next verse here, verse 15. Truly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now, there's a double negative there. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And those two negatives cancel each other out, right? In other words, Jesus is saying the only way 
to enter the kingdom of God is to receive it as a child. And that's a very passive verb, receive the kingdom of God. It's not active, it's passive. We're just receiving. Fall began on September 23rd, and the days now are getting shorter. And if you're like me and you're getting out early to go to work or take your kids to school, all of a sudden, I now have the opportunity to see sunrises again, right? You see sunrises. And each morning, God gives us this amazing gift. As the sun crests over the horizon, God splatters reds and oranges and yellows, and the sky just comes alive. And do you know what you have to do to receive this gift? All you have to do is open your eyes, right? It's there every morning. You just receive it. It's being given to you, right? It's a very passive thing. But what does it mean to receive the kingdom of God like a child? Like a child. What, what's the point of comparison there? Some have suggested that like a child points to that childlike innocence or purity or humility or gentleness. And clearly those people never had a two-year-old. But what, what is the point of comparison here? The point of comparison to a child is that sense of complete and utter dependence. A child is completely and utterly dependent upon their parents. Children are deeply known by their parents before they really know anything. And children are deeply loved by their parents before they can utter a word. Children depend on their parents for everything. Now compare that to some mammals. So the period of gestation for a horse, gestation from uh, the time of conception to the time of birth, is 12 months. For a northern giraffe, the period of gestation is 15 months. And for an African element, elephant, not element. <clears throat> Maybe they're African elements too, but they're not mammals. For African elephants, it's 22 months, right? But when those mammals give birth, all of a sudden, you see, you know, the, the, the baby horse comes out. And within minutes, it's wobbling up on its feet. And then within the first hour, it's off running, right? And so all of a sudden, that baby horse or giraffe, and giraffes are even longer and they're kind of... But, but all of a sudden, those baby elephants and giraffes and horses are off running around. They're, they're relatively independent. They're feeding themselves. They're sleeping by themselves. They're, there are no diapers, right? These mammal parents are living the dream, apparently. Uh, it, th these babies, these mammal babies, are relatively independent. But compare that with a human baby, right? Compare that with a newborn, all of a sudden, when that newborn comes into the world, they need to be held and fed and burped and changed and talked to and comforted and put to sleep, right? And cared for and loved. It's complete and utter dependence. And so to receive the kingdom of God like a child, right, points to that complete and utter dependence. You can't earn it. You can only receive it. It's passive. Now, this story here in Mark 10 appears in the other two synoptic gospels in Luke 18 and in Matthew 19. But it doesn't appear in the gospel of John. John uses a little bit different language to talk about this same idea. He uses the language of being born again. In John chapter 3, John is talking to Nicodemus at night. And Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3 verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus answers Jesus, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot answer, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is saying, it's not about you. What part did you play in being born? 
You didn't have any control over when or to whom or how or where you entered the world. You just kind of went for a ride, right? And came screaming, or went for a ride, and came screaming into the world, right? That's what the kingdom of God is like. Unless we're born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this goes against every fiber of our being. You see, ever since the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, where Adam had the opportunity to earn eternal life, we as human beings have this deep need to earn, to accomplish, to merit, to achieve. We want to live by works. But in the kingdom of God, that's turned completely upside down. It's flipped on its head. You can't earn it. You can only receive it. In fact, the harder you try to earn it, the more it will elude you. The first movie that I remember seeing in the theaters was Star Wars in 1977. That'll tell you how old I am. Uh, 1977. And in, in the original Star Wars, Darth Vader and the Empire have built the Death Star. And he shows it to Princess Leia. And Princess Leia has this great response. She says to Vader, the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems slip through your finger. Right? That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. The more you try to earn it, the more you try to achieve it, the more it slips through your fingers. And the disciples are struggling to understand this. Right? How can this be? Surely works play a part, right? And so to address this, the next, story that Je- the next story that Mark records is a story of Jesus and the rich young ruler in verses 17 through 31. Oh, we'll get to this next week, but you've got this obedient, kind, successful, loving, important person. And he's got it all going on by the world standards. He's got it all figured out. And the disciples look at his resume and think, oh, this guy's in. We want him on our team, Right? But the rich young ruler's works and accomplishments have actually conditioned him to earn his way, to merit his way, to accomplish his way. And so his works actually hinder him from receiving the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's trying to earn it. You can't earn it. You can only receive it. You see, Lucy walked into the wardrobe while playing hide-and-seek. But it was Aslan who drew her into the kingdom of Narnia. She didn't earn it. She didn't receive it. But it was given to her. And so she entered it. And she received it. That's how it is with the kingdom of God. You have to know that Christianity is impossible. That it's a miracle. You have to be born again. You have to receive the kingdom like a child. Now, some of you this morning have been thinking, this is just how you get into the kingdom. You thought you were off the hook this morning. You didn't think I was talking to you because you're already in the kingdom. But receiving the kingdom like a child isn't just about evangelism. It's also about discipleship. You see, receiving the kingdom isn't just how you get in. It's also the way of life in the kingdom. Do you know how radical that is? We live in a world where we feel like we need to justify ourselves and we constantly feel defensive. But a gospel posture is one that says it's not about us, right? We didn't do anything to get into the kingdom. We just received it. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins the Beatitudes with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And being poor in spirit is not a one-time act that gets you into the kingdom of heaven. It's an ongoing attribute of those on the gospel path, those who have life in the gospel. You see, being poor in spirit is pointing to complete and utter dependence. It's a simple, childlike faith. And that's relatively easy to say. It's a little bit harder to understand, but it's oh so difficult 
to practice. You see, this gospel way of life, the attribute of being poor in spirit, leads us to action. It shapes our character. It shapes our life. It leads us to dependence instead of defensiveness, to simplicity instead of self-righteousness, to curiosity instead of callousness, to gratitude instead of grumbling, to generosity instead of greed, to humility instead of hubris, to joy instead of justifying ourselves, to wonder instead of work, and to worship instead of worry. And that's the way of the kingdom of God. You can't earn it. You can only receive it. And you can only receive it because it's been offered to you. You see, Lucy entered the kingdom of Narnia because Aslan created a passage in that wardrobe. Aslan called her from one world to another world. Aslan offered the kingdom. Lucy received the kingdom. And today, Jesus offers the kingdom of God. And do you know how he offers the kingdom of God? He became a child. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Right? Jesus became a child. He became an infant. He became a baby. Jesus lived for nine months in a woman's uterus with amniotic fluid being fed by the umbilical cord, right? And then one night, he came screaming into the world in Bethlehem, and they laid him in a manger. The one, the eternal one, who lived from eternity past, through whom all things were made, was born into time as a helpless, dependent infant. In Galatians, Paul says it this way, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Receiving the kingdom, right? Being born again, becoming a child is the way Jesus offers the kingdom. It's the way we receive the kingdom. And it's the way we live in the kingdom. You didn't deserve it. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. But it's being offered to you. And so Jesus says, reach up and take your father's hand and walk into the darkness, because the kingdom of God is a place for children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to receive the kingdom like a child, that this would be a well-worn path for us, that we would move towards dependence instead of of defensiveness, that we would move towards joy instead of justifying ourselves over and over again. Father, would you shape our characters with this simple childlike faith? And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.